And we're going to be in Acts chapter 11 today. Um, but before we go there, I think um, it would be wrong as a pastor if I didn't really bring up what happened in Israel this week. And I think that needs to be talked about. And my wife and I were talking about it, and it's like, it's a miracle, or is it technology? And we're just going to go off a little bit and talk about this. And I think most of you know Israel has a missile defense system called the Iron Dome. What I did not know is they have three missile defense systems, and a lot of people are nodding their head like they knew, and I didn't know this. Give me a second here, sorry. Oh, everything's much bigger now. Um, and so one of them is the Iron Dome, and we all heard of the Iron Dome, right? And that's an all-weather defense system. But they have another one, and it's called David Sling. Who doesn't like that name? David Sling, right? And this is designed to intercept the newest generation of missiles. And then on top of that, they have something called the Arrow. And those are anti-ballistic missiles, right? And they do surface-to-surface -surface air stuff. I don't know what it all means. I just think that they have three and all the names are cool, right? Well, for this week, as most of you, if not everybody should know, it was a matter of 45 minutes, and it was solid rainfall of rockets over Israel. And I assume everybody knows, and it's somewhere projected between 180 and 210 missiles were rained on them, and they were launched through all the bases in Iran. And if you watched it on the news, I'm assuming everybody saw it, how many missiles it was just like, I don't know a lightning storm, a thunderstorm, whatever it is, just things were falling from the sky. It was crazy. And it was the largest attack on Israel ever. Now, some rockets got through, but they ended up hitting empty buildings, so forth and so on, right? So that's amazing. That's a miracle. Now, one person died in Israel, and it wasn't a Jew. It was a Palestinian walking in the streets of Jericho, not taking shelter. And the others that died were Iranians because the ballistic missiles went up and fell right down on them. And so five people died, five Iranians, but zero Jews. Is that not a miracle? So it's a great time because even the Jews in Israel are having a hard time understanding. We need to be praying for them. They don't understand how over 200 missiles or upwards of 200 missiles were fired and zero deaths. And there's testimonies going around of Jews standing there and missiles are falling around them and they walked away. That's amazing. Amir Safadi comes out and says, hey guys, we're fighting on seven fronts right now. And I don't know if you guys know that. This is this one thing going on. They're fighting on the Gaza front, the West Bank, Syria, Iraq, Lebanon, Iran, and Yemen. All those people right now have something to do with attacking Israel. And what are we doing here, huh? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, and here in America, we are asking them not to fire at the Iranian nuclear plants. Why? What is the purpose of that, and why would we even get involved? They're fighting on seven fronts. Once again, largest missile attack in Israel, zero Jews were killed. That's a miracle. Jeremiah 31.10 says, Hear the word of the Lord, O nations, and declare it in the coastlands far away. Say, Hello, who scattered Israel will gather him and will keep him as shepherds keeps his flock. And in Ezekiel, it says, They say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will take the people of Israel from the nations among which they have, nations among which they have gone, and I will gather them from all around and bring them to their own land. He is bringing them back. He's been bringing them back forever. He's been bringing them back since they were a nation again. I personally do not think that's getting broken up again. I think it's here to stay until we get raptured. And it's crazy to see how hated they are and how it's starting to grow, right? And everybody forgets what happened in October 17th, I think was the date, 7th. And here we are, and it's just like over and over again how it's all their fault. It's all their fault. 
Well, what does it say in Psalms 83 2? For behold, your enemies make an uproar. Those who hate you have raised their heads. They lay crafty plans against your people. They consult together against your treasured ones. They say, come, let us wipe them out as a nation. Let the name of Israel be remembered no more. It's not going to happen, guys. Right? It's not. Amir says this, and I love this. The story of Israel is not of man-made things. It's not of human effort. It's not a story of human success. It is a story of God's faithfulness, and it will continue forth on that. So how much does God love Israel? Well, listen, Isaiah 49, 15, can a woman forget her nursing child that she should have no compassion on the son of her womb? Even these may forget, yet I will not forget you. Behold, I have engraved you on the palm of my hands. Your walls are continually before me. God is saying that his faithfulness to Israel is greater than a mother's love of their own child. He will not forget his people or his promises he made them. Okay, we're going to pray now and get into Acts 11. I just wanted to have that conversation. So let's do it. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for this morning. And I thank you, Lord, that you miracle. It's a miracle, Lord, watching that and seeing that nobody perished. I pray, Lord, for protection on Israel. I pray, Lord, that you continue to guide, lead the leadership over there, Lord. Um, you know, the more you hear and the more you read about it, they have clear direction, Lord. I just pray, Lord, that they repent and cry out to you. I pray that you fill me with your spirit today, Lord. You know how I feel, you know, every Sunday, Lord, just fill me with your spirit. I only want your words to be said. I pray that each and every one of us will get something out of this, Lord, and that you will bless this time that we have together. And we give it all to you in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're now in Acts 11. And it says, Now the apostles and the brothers who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the the circumcision party criticized him, saying, You went to uncircumcised men and ate with them. But Peter began and explained to them in order. I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. Something like a great sheet descending, being let down from heaven by its four corners, and it came down to me. Looking at it closely, I observed animals and beasts of prey and reptiles and birds of the air. And I heard a voice saying to me, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But I said, by no means, Lord, for nothing common or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But the voice answered a second time from heaven, what God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times, and all was drawn up again into heaven. And behold, at that very moment, three men arrived at the house in which we were, sent to me from Caesarea. And the Spirit told me, go with them. Make no distinction. These six brothers also accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. And he told us how he had seen an angel stand in the house and say, Send a Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter. He will declare to you a message by which you will be saved, you and all your household. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them just as on us at the beginning. And I remember the word of the Lord and how he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave the same gift to them as he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? And when they heard these things, they fell silent and they glorified God saying, Then to the Gentiles also, God has granted repentance that leads to life. So Peter goes up to Jerusalem, and obviously he's accused right away. You entered a house with uncircumcised men, and you're eating with them. The circumcised party is obviously the Christians who still followed, or the people who still followed Moses' law. And we saw that before in Galatians 2.12, when it said, before certain men came from James, 
He was eating with the Gentiles, but when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcised party. We were talking about that a few weeks ago, right? He didn't want to kill around, kind of want to be seen with them after they all showed up. Now, the issue was not necessarily preaching to the Gentiles, but sharing a meal with them. That has a lot to do in the Bible, sharing meals, a time of fellowship. You were with uncircumcised men and you ate with them. That signified the acceptance of fellowship. Now, the situation could have led to a significant division in the church, but Peter brings up to the circumcised believers in Jerusalem, and he summarizes the whole event of what we went through last week in Acts chapter 10. He's talking about his vision. He's talking about his response. He's saying, here's where I'm supposed to go. I'm supposed to go to Cornelius' house. And then he, he connects that to the day of Pentecost and the spirit back to him. He's saying, look, it happened to us and then it happened to them. Remember in Acts 1, 4 through 5, and while saying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard it from me for John baptized with water, but you baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. He's saying, look, we got baptized with the Holy Spirit. They got baptized with the Holy Spirit. And he says, this defense was based on God's action, not mine. God's. Who am I? So since God is making no distinction between Jews and Gentiles when it comes to salvation, Peter is saying, how am I supposed to oppose the will of God? Opposing the will of God, a dangerous place. Right? Jonah. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amitti, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for the evil has come up before me. That's how evil they were. It came up before him. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. And he went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid fare, went down into it, to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. Not staying in the Lord's will and definitely trying to oppose God's will. Bad move, Jonah. And the Lord appeared a great, and the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. Opposing. Disobeying God. Go preach in Nineveh. I'm going to go to the opposite place. Now we know how the story ends. He was disobedient, and there's a storm, and the fish eats him, but he repents. What about Jesus rebuking Peter? And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me. For you are not setting the mind on the things of God, but on the things of man, opposing God's will misunderstanding the events of the salvation plan. Jesus rebuking him, get behind me. And then back in Acts, where we are now in verse 18, it says, the saints alongside Peter acknowledged that the conversation of the Gentiles was initiated by God. They should not resist his will. Now this realization gave two significant things that happened. It maintained the unity of the body of the church of Christ. They're all getting together, Jews and Gentiles. But there's something else that happened. It created a significant divide between the church-age believers, the Christians, and the temple worshipers in Jerusalem. Initially, when you think about it, the commoners, the, the temple worshipers, viewed the Christians pretty favorably. We see it in Acts 2.47, 5.13, and 5.26. But following this event, the opposition began to grow. A little bit more tension came up. And this hostility is evident in Acts 12.2. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword, and when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. So what you saw before in Acts 2.47 
when it reads, you know, certain things about how they were accepted, they were okay, they were happy. Now, all of a sudden, it pleased them to kill James. This Jewish opposition was starting to get tense. So the first part of chapter 11 that we just went through is really just a repeat of chapter 10. And John Corson talks about it this way. Peter reiterated the vision that he received in chapter 10. Now this repetition is intriguing considering the limited space on the scrolls. And I thought this was very interesting because there was limited space. The scrolls themselves could be up to 35 feet long and everything that they wrote down was from the Holy Spirit, right? So why is the Holy Spirit giving us the same exact story? Because it's important. The Holy Spirit is, 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 is really urging us, don't look over this. Why am I repeating this? We talked about repeating things last week. Why? Why am I repeating it? And what was the message? What the Father declares clean should not be considered common or unclean. That's the message. That's where we are. So we got the first part of Acts, the repeat story. They're all on the same page now. And then we're going to continue in verse 19. And it says, Now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word no, to no one except the Jews. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists, also preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. The report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. And when he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad, and he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. A great many people were added to the Lord. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him back to Antioch. And for a whole year, they met with the church and taught a great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. So this is pivotal right here. Maybe I say that every week, but I'll keep saying it. This is really the first time that in a, a, a bigger scale, they were evangelizing to the Gentiles. This was it. This was the first time. Now, there was previous interactions we know with the Samaritans, and we have they're partially Jewish, and the Ethiopian eunuch, we know that. And we also know about Cornelius, who sought out the gospel. But that was it, really, right? There wasn't a lot going on. This is where we're taking it up a little bit bigger. Take it up a notch. And this is where the church was taking the initiative to reach uncircumcised Greeks with the gospel message. And it links back to Stephen. All of these webs come off of Stephen. It's really neat to watch. And you start reading more and more. They all spread out, right? Acts 8, 4. And those who were scattered went about preaching the word. And then we remember that it's Saul was getting intensified. Remember that? And his persecution on them. Pushing the gospel out to the Gentiles. From that point... In Stephen's martyrdom, it started to spread even more. Now, Antioch at this time was a significant commercial hub, and it was actually the third largest city in the Roman Empire. And it had a very large Jewish community. And even though it was known for a lot of corruption, it's where Paul it will base later on his missionary work. Those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose, they traveled out. The gospel spread in Antioch thanks to these unnamed Christians because it says now those who were scattered out because of persecution arose. So they don't talk about who they were, but what we do know is they're out and they're serving God and they're spreading the gospel. And so the church figures out, hey, what is going on 
in Antioch. Let's send Barnabas. Let's go see what's going on. Now, this is very similar, if you guys remember, to when Peter and John went out to evaluate Philip's ministry in Samaria. Same kind of thing. We're sending out, send out Barnabas. And upon arrival, he recognizes God is genuinely working. And he responded with joy. It says, and when he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad and he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. Is this guy not staying true to his nickname? What's his nickname? Son of Encouragement. And in this verse, in this part of Acts chapter 11, it describes him three ways. He's a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and full of faith. And then it says, he went to look for Saul in Tarsus. And when he found him, he brought him back. Now remember, Barnabas, just a few chapters ago, was the one who got him in with the rest of the disciples. And when they came to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples. And they were all afraid of him, for they did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them on the road, he had seen the Lord who spoke to him and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. You guys remember that? It was a few chapters ago. Barnabas is like involved, getting Saul ground in the church. He's making things happen. He already vouched for him once. Let me go get Paul. He's bold. So these two are working together. They're teaching and they're growing the church. And really this partnership becomes foundational for Paul's future missionary journeys. It's all connected. So he's there for a year, and they're teaching a number of people. They're there for a year. And the church continues to grow. Acts 2.41. So those who received the word were baptized, and there were added about that day 3,000. What about Acts 2.47? Praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Acts 4.4. 4, but many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of men became about 5,000. And it goes on and on and on. Acts 6.1. Acts 5.14. Now in these days, Acts 6.1, when the disciples were increasing in number. Every week we're in Acts and we're hearing about the church and people just falling in love with the Lord and becoming believers. So many people were coming to Christ. I'm going to spend a few minutes this morning on this topic. Because I don't know about you, but I feel like the Christian population is declining in America. And I'm only going to say America. Because I want to clarify that people across the globe are having visions, and there are people being saved in droves in other countries, just not here. The last census of Christians in America was 66%. Now, I remember when it was 80. And we used to make jokes. Are you an 80 percenter? Do you come on Easter and Christmas? Is that who you are? You're an 80 percent Christian, are you? Right? You'd make jokes about it. 66 percent, 219 million believers in the U.S., according to the census. Now, I don't know about you guys. I don't feel that way. So I had to ask myself, why does America seem so dead in Christ? Well, one thing I'd say, and this is not everything, this is just me coming through, is it's hard for people to focus now. There's a lot going on everywhere. But also, does anybody have any idea how many denominations there are for Christianity? I looked it up. 45,000. 45,000 is what I found. There's a denomination for everyone. John 17, 21, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. May we all be one. Jesus wants unity within the church. 
Paul teaches about this in 1 Corinthians 1.10. I appeal to you, brother, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and in the same judgment. What's he doing? He's urging the church, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, stay unified. Do not tear down. Now, there's a few major shifts throughout history. The Great Schism, Eastern Orthodoxy and Roman Catholicism, that, that was one big shift. The Protestant Reformation, Martin Luther, John Calvin, we know that one. What came from that? Lutheranism, Calvinism, Reformed, Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, Pentecostal. And then from those, they've divided into other, more churches, more sects, right? All just going on. And those are just some of the major things that have happened throughout the church in history. But we're in America. So let's talk about why a church might split in America that's just a church, like Calvary Chapel Arlington. Now, these are going to be crazy, and you're not going to believe it probably, and you're probably going to go home and have to type it yourself, but let's just go over a few. The color of the carpet. I don't like the carpet. I think we need to go and do something else. Where is the piano supposed to be? I don't like where the piano is. Right? We got to take the people that don't like it and go start a new church. I don't really want to say this next one out loud, but it's funny. Fighting over fried chicken. Supposedly there was a church, and at the potluck, they were arguing on who got the last piece of fried chicken. <laughs> I'm sorry. Whether Adam and Eve had belly buttons. Now there's a reason to split a church. Disagreement over facial hair. Yeah. Okay, this one, this one, yeah, worship music. You know that one's big, right? That is a big one. They're saying that is the most common reason. Why is there not only an organ? Why is there an electric guitar that's of the devil? Whatever it is, you know, it, we need to just do this. We need to do that. Christmas decorations. I guess the church got so upset Half of the congregation wanted a real tree. The other half wanted a fake tree. They just started a new church. Clapping during service. Pews or chairs? I like chairs. I want pews. I can only go to a church that has a pew with a little thing in front of it with the cup that holds my little communion thing. Just a few more, sorry. The length of the pastor sermons. Proper placement of the communion table. And donuts versus bagels. <laughs> now, those are lighthearted. I get it, right? And in disagreements can normally be resolved through communication and humility. Now, I want you to think about how the world might see that looking in as we're believers. I mean, I don't even know how you straight face how you would say, oh, we started a new church because they took the last piece of fried chicken. I don't get it, right? And unfortunately, I know this, we might be thinking, there's no way a church split over X, Y, or Z over pews or chairs. I can tell you from experience, it most likely happened. I have seen people leave for many different reasons. This is just one thing I just notice, right? I don't understand how you would explain that to somebody and not think that they would not take the gospel of Jesus Christ seriously. Another reason I'm going to touch on is churches are no longer teaching the full counsel of God. Instead, they're coming up and pastors are saying, this is how I feel. And it's not about how we feel. It's about what the word of God says. Chapter by chapter, verse by verse, that's how I teach and that's how it should be taught.
So I went through all this, and I thought, yeah, all that. And then I thought, what else, Lord? Turn to 2 Timothy 3.1. But understand this, that in the last days, there will, be, there will come times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, appeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. Avoid such people, for among them are those who creep into the households and capture weak women, burdened with sins and led astray by various passions, always learning and never able to arrive at the knowledge of the truth. Just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also oppose the truth. Men corrupted in mind and disqualified regarding the faith. But they will not get very far, for their folly will be plain to all, as it was that of these two men. Now, probably through history, every pastor stood up and said, isn't that like today? And I think every time the congregation said, yes. But boy, is it really like today. <laughs> you know, and I listened to John Corson way back when he would say it, and it was funny, and, and it's true, and, and, you know, Chuck Smith would bring everything up going on. But it really is like today. We love ourselves. The simple gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what we need to focus on. And then in Acts eleven twenty six, 26, we're continuing. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year, they met with the church and taught a great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. The birth name of the term Christians. This term likely coined by outsiders meant followers of Christ. We are followers of Christ. And it was a new identity for them in this city. Are you a Christian? I'm a Christian. Peter 1, 4, but let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin the household of God, and if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? Embrace the name, Peter sang, even in the face of suffering. Back then, in Christ, I'm in Christ, I'm a believer. It was central. They were distinct from Judaism. They were Christians, they were in Christ, they were believers of Christ. Now the word Christian is used two other times in the New Testament, and that is in Acts 26.28 and 1 Peter 4.16. They wanted to be recognized as a distinct group. They were a distinct group. They were Christians. They were the ones that believed Jesus raised from the dead. They were the ones that had the truth. And at that point, you think about it, the church is getting more and more separated from Judaism. So we continue back in Acts, verse 27, chapter 11. Now these days, the prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. And one of them named Agabus stood up and foretold the Spirit that there would be a great famine over all the world. 
This took place in the day of Claudius. So the disciples determined everyone according to his ability to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. And they did so, sending it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. So these believers obviously traveled to Antioch who had the gift of prophecy. And Antioch at this time had become a pretty big hub for Gentile Christians. And there was increasing interactions between the Jewish and the Gentile believers. And so Agabus, this prophet, predicted, hey, a severe famine is coming. Agabus also warns Paul about his coming arrest in Jerusalem in Acts 21.10. While we were staying for many days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea, and coming up to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands and said, Thus says the Lord, thus says the Holy Spirit, This is how the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Agabus, obviously filled with the Spirit. He's going around, he's giving guidance, he's saying warnings. He's inspired, he's living under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He is filled up and he's going out and he has these prophecies. And he's referencing it to the time of Emperor Claudius. Now Claudius later is the one that expels the Jews from Rome. In Acts 18.2 it says, And he found a Jew named Aquila, and a native of Pontus recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. So at this time that Claudius is reigning, there is a severe famine. Agabus has said, hey, it's coming. Get ready. So the disciples determined everyone according to his ability to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. Send financial help to Judea according to their means. It talks about it more in 1 Corinthians 16.2 and 2 Corinthians 9.7. And he's saying, hey, believers, give according to your ability. Suggesting a a voluntary thing. Give according to what you can give. It really highlights a biblical principle of cheerfully willing to give. 2 Corinthians 8, 12 For if the readiness is there, it is acceptable according to what a person has, not according to what a person does not have. For I do not mean that others should be eased and you should be burdened, but that as a matter of fairness, your abundance at the present time should supply their need, so that their abundance may supply your need, that there may be fairness." Paul emphasizing, we should give what we have which does not burden us to those in need. The act of generosity fostered a bond between these two churches. And it talks about it in Romans 15, 27. For they were pleased to do it, and indeed they owe it to them. For if the Gentiles have come to share their spiritual blessings, they ought to also be in service to them in material blessings. And then it continues in verse 30 and says, and they did so, sending it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. So the relief funds were entrusted to who? The elders in Jerusalem. The first time the word elders is mentioned. But what does it indicate? What does it mean? It means that the development of the leadership structure was starting to happen in the community. Acts 14, 23, and when they had appointed elders 
for them in every church with prayer and fasting. They committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. So they appointed the elders to the churches that they established. The local church governance is starting. Elders, it became a regular practice. So what does this mean? Well, you know, Antioch believers challenge us. They challenge us to give generously. When we see others in need, we should be helping them. I am not talking about helping somebody that you know is going to go do drugs again over and over and over or go spend it on alcohol. But if there is somebody in genuine need and we have the ability, we need to help. Because it said we are called to give according to our ability. And not just that, but it says with the heart of compassion. Don't be mad about it either. That's not going to solve anything. I guess. So the church in Antioch, made up of mostly Gentiles, supported the Judean believers, really showing the global nature of the early church. They were all as one under Jesus Christ. And as believers, we too are called for the wider body of Christ. We need to be helping who is in need. Galatians 6, 2. We're going to end with this. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Bear one another's burdens. We need to live as one body, folks. It's hard, right? You, 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 you want to know why the churches are small? Because, or church attendance is going down, I mean, is because we are all just about self, unfortunately. And this country doesn't help us. And that's why in other countries, there's revivals going on. Because they don't have everything we have. We're going to take communion today and Ron Trent is going to lead us. Uh, I will close in prayer and come on up, Ron. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for this time. What a blessing it is, Lord, to serve you and to just go over your word, Lord, and I just pray, Lord, that you will watch over this congregation, Lord, and that you will let us become on fire for you, as I know they were in Acts. Lord, we want to be on fire for you. I don't want anybody in my life to not know that I'm a believer, Lord, or anybody I interact with, Lord. Give me and all of us the boldness to speak your name, but it's really simple, Lord. It's just the gospel of Jesus Christ. It doesn't have to be complicated. I give you this time, Lord. Please bless Ron, Lord, as he leads us in communion. And just watch over all that we're doing today, Lord, and this week. And as always, Lord, put somebody in our path, Lord, that needs to know you. That needs you, Lord, in their life. And let us be that light that they can see. Only because of you, though. I lift it up to you in Jesus' name. Amen.